Welcome to the second part of this final encounter. Hephaestus is going to put you through some very confusing mechanics, but we'll break them down in a way that can be reasonably understood. Before starting, we want a lot of different positions picked out for different mechanics, including clock spots. There is some overlap that I will mention with each mechanic, as well as go over the positioning itself. Also know that the auto attacks are very painful, shared tank AoEs. Any point where auto attacks are going out, both tanks need to be away from the group. The AoE isn't tiny, and again, it hurts. Don't be afraid of some pre-pull mitigation. The first thing he does, aside from autos, is Ionupire. It's a hard-hitting raid-wide AoE that applies a short bleed to all players. Next is Tyrant's Unholy Darkness. This is a spread tank buster AoE on both tanks. Have one tank heavily mitigate and the other use none. Instead, have them provoke as necessary and use their invuln. Have the mitigating tank rejoin the party and let the invuln tank take the next two auto attacks alone. Because the invuln, the shared damage is of no consequence. It's the only real way to use them in this fight. The next mechanic will begin before the invuln ends, signaling the end of his autos for quite some time. There are four tank busters in this fight, so plan your mitigations and invulns accordingly. Natural alignment is the first major mechanic, which will mark two plays with the natural alignment debuff. They are based on roll, DPS, or support. These plays will have purple marks under them and are now the basis of several mechanics to come, but will not partake in any of them. If they take any mechanic damage, the raid will wipe. Instead, they get a heavy bleed of nearly 20k a tick for 48 seconds. While they will not be partaking in alignment mechanics and thus taking no damage, this bleed will still require you to baby them. Have both of these players run up the middle of the arena and stand in front of the boss, away from the party. Everyone else will stack up at the edge of the boss's hitbox. Watch over their heads as two bars will appear over one of their heads when the boss casts Twist Nature. A stack marker icon at the top and a targeted AoE on bottom. Both bars will begin to fill, one faster than the other at random. Regardless of which it is, Tyrant's Flare will be cast, placing AoEs under every player. We're stacked up in these positions to minimize the flare coverage. Then everyone must dodge relative to the stack or spread mechanic. Forcible Fire 3 and 2 respectively. The two natural alignment players should remain up north no matter what. If Forcible Fire 3, the stack, is first, just step inward together. Don't go too far as to walk into the natural alignment baited AoEs. If it is Forcible Fire 2, the spread, spread roughly toward your clock spots around the baited circles. Let melees have frontward positions as a result. Don't go too far up north as to run your flare into the alignment players. The AoEs are fairly big. Ashing Blaze will be cast, lighting one of his wings up. Get to the side of the arena his wing is not on and resolve the second mechanic. If the stack was second, just group up. If the spread was second, you have some decisions to make. You need to decide spread positions, ideally static ones. We have positions like this using the top edges of squares. The natural alignment people take mid in front of the boss. The two healers can take the two spots behind them to minimize their movement. Or if you have a black mage, well there you go. The other six spots fill in with people choosing where they want to go. It should look something like this, but with two people missing every spread. Their natural alignments and thus out of the way in the front middle. Further keep in mind, this is flipped across the axis meaning your order is based on the center of the arena. If dodging the Ashing Blaze to the right, if you are all the way at the east wall, when dodging left, you will go all the way to the western wall. This way you can assign high movement players to further away spots. Pop sprint though. Regardless of which pattern you get, return to the center line and move to the front two rows. On the west side, three illusory Hephaestos will spawn, doing AoEs down the rows. The safe spot will always be in the front two rows. There will also be a second set on the east side, but you never have to look at these because they are opposite of the first set. If the first safe spot is the second row from the front, the second safe spot must be the front row, and the reverse. 
if the front row is the safe row, the second safe spot is the second row. So hide in the empty row, then immediately run to hide in the second safe row, while performing the main mechanic. Move to the empty row and react to the new set of bars above the alignment players. Fire and Ice, or Forcible Tri-Fire and Forcible Die Freeze. Remember Part 1. Try and Die is the number of AoEs there will be. There will be three fire stacks with two players in each. Ice will have two stacks with three people in each. And Natural Alignment still do nothing, but in a specific spot. The four marker we use is placed on the middle line on the front two rows. This gives the alignment players a position for both rows. Everyone else, we can give a static spot once more. Pick two DPS to be floaters, and also tanks are relegated to floaters. Floaters being you float between spots as needed. Healer group, we want to put mid, but away from the alignment players. Basically, opposite side of the row you all have to squeeze into. This will require them to move a little bit, but puts them in the best spot to heal during this. You can have them off to the side too, like my group does, but that may make healing slightly harder. Choose one of the sides to put the static DPS players. My group has me and our ninja to the right. The third and final spot will be both float groups. This is your spot when you aren't floating. Because natural alignment is role based, you can have tanks float when it is support alignment or the DPS float for DPS alignment. You will merely take over the duties of the players who are alignment, or are alignment yourself. Pair tank 1 with healer 1, and tank 2 with healer 2. Do the same for DPS. If your partner healer gets alignment, you take over their duties. The only issue is if your partner doesn't get alignment, but you still have to float. You'll have to take over the other healer's duty instead. But this ensures you only have three possible positions to know, and natural alignment. With groups chosen, we go into the actual mechanic solution. If it is fire, it will target the three furthest away players. Having one group left, right, and mid is called the Scripe Strat. But what some people seem to neglect to mention is the specific placement of players. You want to make a T-shape. One player in each group will step about half a block inward toward the alignment players. Since fire is baited on the furthest people, these three are too close to get it. This guarantees their partners get it, and the AoEs are large enough that they will be hit by the explosion, taking the stack properly. The three outer players will be on the line, or as close to the line as they can get without stepping into the path of a clone. It will look something like this as a picture form, if the footage isn't enough to see. Ice is similar and is based on the two closest players. Group up right and left with two players on the lines of the squares. The designated in players on those sides will get the ice, while the two middle players run over to fill in the third slot, also on the line. I recommend keeping this static too. The middle group's far fire will always go left, close fire to the right, far and close being relative to the alignment players. For ice, the bait players want to be a bit further out than with fire. Maybe only a fourth of a block toward the alignment players. With this, you have all groups covered and positions as static as you can get it. So running through this part in order... Group up after the second stack or spread to heal. Then head out to your sides while in the first two rows. Adjust to the safe row based on the first set of clones and watch for if it's fire or ice. Get into those positions. While moving to the other row, step inward for heals if possible, and then move back out for the second mechanic's positions. If everyone is healed enough, you have now completed Natural Alignment 1. I may be massively over explained this positioning and such, but I feel that this is far harder to get down than the coming high concept. So I'd rather spend time here to give a new way to float than there. Quickly group back up for another Ionia Pyre, with the auto attacks now resuming. Keep the tanks away. There will be a second Tyrant's Unholy Darkness, which you can again do invuln strats, or save for the third or fourth sets. High Concept is a very slow, but very very dangerous cast. You will want shields and several layers of mitigation to survive. Upon landing the hit, he will become untargetable for the next 40 seconds. Eight debuffs will go out with only one rule I can see. Stack markers are role based, but this info doesn't seem to have much use. 
This is a puzzle mechanic with four instances of damage, so some healing is needed, but not much. Quickly heal up from the high concept cast and spread to your designated locations. There will be two alpha A markers, one short, eight seconds long, and one long. There will be two betas, B markers, one short and one long. There will be two gammas, Y markers, one short and one long. A yellow marker with two people in it and a short timer. A blue marker with three people in it and a short timer. These last two are stacks of that size. Designate a corner for the stack markers to share along with one each for A, B, and Y. We do stacks at two and three, color coordinated, in Northwest. Northeast is A, Southeast is B, and Southwest is C, which is our budget Y. Have the short letters go to their corners after being healed, and everyone else go to the stack corner. Have long A in the two stack, long B and Y in the three stack. These will explode a normal stack sized AoE and do damage, but that's it, we're done with that. A, B, and Y will explode into large AoEs when their timers run out. Anyone hit will be given an alchemy icon for 30 seconds. A is a red fire with secondary water and wind elements. B is a yellow potion with secondary lightning and wind elements. Y is a brown leaf with secondary lightning and water elements. When the short mechanics all go off at the same time, everyone will run to the mid. Yes, everyone. You want some heals? Avoid walking into the new towers on your way, while the alchemy players take note of the tower colors. They can be green wind, blue water, or purple lightning. If you are colorblind, try and watch the effect. The towers do all have different effects rising out of their borders, or hopefully you have a static member call it out. The purple also looks sort of blue, so even those of us with color can make a mistake. Keep in mind the blue is a much brighter blue rather than a dark blue. Anyway, check the tower color or element. Notice that each alchemy only shares one element with the other two alchemies. While mid, the two players who have the same element as the towers will want to stand close together. The third player will stay a little back and is unused for this section. This is now referred to as the leftover alchemy. A tether will appear between alchemy players who are very close together. And after two seconds, mix their alchemies together. You cannot pass the buff or mix with someone who does not have an alchemy, making stacking with them completely safe. Combining water will make water fish. Combining lightning will make lightning horse. And combining wind will make wind bird. To take these towers, you must have the matching symbol. It will still do a good 30 to 40k damage to the players inside, but for them, the mechanic is over. Take your tower, and then run back to the stack spot, slightly spread out so as not to mix your alchemies again. During the towers will also be an ashing blaze, so make sure everyone is on the correct side of the arena, including the tower people. This is where the mechanic gets tricky. The long A, B, and Y will go to their corners like the short timers, the stack players have a little work to do. You need to keep track of the alchemy that was not used. Fire, potion, or leaf. This person will return to their corner or join the now finished tower players. Either works, just don't mix with the tower players. The two stack player will go clockwise to A or B depending on whether or not fire was used. If the leftover alchemy is fire, go to B. If they aren't, stop at A. The three stack player will go counterclockwise to Y or B, depending on whether or not the leaf was used. If the leftover alchemy is leaf, go to B. If they aren't, stop at Y. For sake of example, let's just say the leftover player is yellow potion, two person stack will go to A, and three person stack to Y. When the second set of debuffs go off, the person at B will now have a second potion, the two players at A and Y now have two fires and leafs, respectively. That's six alchemies, two of each main element. Four towers will appear this time and will all be the same element, wind, water, or lightning. Our goal is to once again have two sets of players mix and take the towers. There's a problem here though. Main elements override secondary elements. If wind towers appear, you cannot have both fire alchemies group up. Since the main element is fire, it will mix the fires into ifrit instead of winds into birds. 
you instead both need to group up with a yellow potion to make four wins. Everyone group up toward mid, but not exactly mid, for healing. Near the middle two towers should be good. What we want is to group up into two groups of three, mirroring the first set of towers. Put all three long letter debuff players south, with the stack markers and leftover alchemy player north. Like this, each group will have one fire, potion, and leaf. The two players with the matching tower colors will mix between their towers, and the third player will just stay away. And because the groups are split, you know which towers you both need to take. Watch out for another Ashing Blaze during these towers. The two players who already did towers should see their debuffs run out by this point, so go wherever. With all towers taken, you have completed the mechanic. You will near immediately become targetable and cast Deconceptualize, removing all alchemy buffs. Stay spread out enough to not mix, and you can move on to the next mechanic. Some tips for this? Again, it takes a good full two seconds to mix. If you stack on someone you aren't supposed to, running away will work. Pop Sprint for the second set of towers, because there are six of you and some of you are trying to get north and others south. Plus you want to be relatively mid for healing. Speaking of being mid, during the second set of debuffs, the stack players can be more towards mid. The A, B, and Y debuffs are about two squares in radius. You do not need to be all the way in the corner too. You can be further toward mid and better positioned as a result. And finally, do not stand directly on top of each other for mixing. Wiggle a little bit so that one player is one or two steps further north or south than the other. This way you can pick towers without any communication. If your partner is already in position and you're running from, say, the north to south, stop just short of your mixing partner and be relegated to the northern tower. Make sure you're all relatively close as deconceptualized finishes. Quickly heal up the tower damage for Ionia Pyre and more auto attacks. So keep the tanks a little away like normal. You should also be getting another opener at this point. Next is Limitless Desolation. This is a much simpler but three-part mechanic for every player. Split up west and east based on roll and decide some basic spread positions for similar reasons to Natural Alignment 1. This is our chosen specific spread positions. Put melee more in with ranged further back so they have more room to maneuver. The exact moment the cast finishes, one player from each roll will explode into an AoE, one support and one DPS. One tower will appear on each side of the arena within the first three rows. Then finally, a large ground AoE will appear under the person who was chosen to explode. This AoE and the tower will both explode at the same time, so you must place this AoE away from the tower, then go into it. Miss the tower, you wipe. This will happen four times, but very close together, and forces all players to participate. The four explosions will all go off before the first tower explodes. This makes it a little easier to move around and get to your tower without clipping other players. Depending on your position, you may want to aim your camera in a specific way. Because I am in front, the boss gets in the way, so I aim downward and can see four squares. If I explode and do not see my tower appear, I know it is in one of the back two spots off screen. The main issue with this mechanic is reacting to what everyone else is doing. You need to get to your tower without getting hit by someone else's explosion, or placing your AoEs in the way of people. Try and stick to the wall if you've yet to explode. Be ready to make room for the melee up front to get to the back. Again, towers can spawn in any spot within the first three rows, which could mean a melee up front will have to run all the way to the back row. Go into this mechanic with a little bit of shielding and you won't even need heals during it. The explosions do quite a bit of damage, but the towers barely even do 7k damage. Though, you will want to very quickly run back center for healing since Ionia Pyre is coming out again. Tanks away for autos. We will have the third Tyrant's Unholy Darkness here. If you got any invulns left, now is probably the time to use it. Natural Alignment comes back, but now comes with inverse magics. Either one or both players will be marked with this. This reverses the meaning of the bars. If the stack icon fills first, but they have inverse magics, it's actually spread first. We want the alignment players to be slightly spread out this time. 
This was true with the first set, but the current alignment players whose circle is spinning will be the one the mechanics are based off of. If you see the icon spinning under an inverse magics player, remember to do the opposite of the bars. I would say this one is much easier to handle otherwise, as instead of Tyrant's Flare, we have more clones. These clones follow the exact same rules as the first set. Our group has set spots for this as well, but you can just put the alignment players to the far west wall and use limitless desolation spots. We instead put healers mid, alignment players one square away, and everyone spread from there. This gives healers a good spot to heal and doesn't force them to the wall if they both end up with natural alignment. Or if you're really confident in your team, don't have a spot for natural alignment at all. There needs to be room for everyone to fit anyway, so everyone going to their static spots, no matter what, works. Just don't catch them in the stack by accident. The fire and ice alignment handle the exact same way as before. You do not need to change anything besides checking for inverse magics. Inverse magics makes the fire bar filling do an ice hit first. As the second element goes off, there will be an ashing blaze to finish off the attack instead of Ionia Pyre. Use this opportunity to heal up and start your next two minute burst window. Now he'll do the Ionia Pyre, Autos, the fourth and final Tyrant's Unholy Darkness, and then we have High Concept 2. We have one new buff in this, a red singular person. This is a solo stack. Just don't hit anyone else with your debuff. Treat this the exact same way as High Concept 1, but with the spots slightly adjusted. Rather than two players having stacks, one of the long letter debuffs will also have the two person stack, and another with the single person stack. Have the two person stack go to two, and the single person stack go to three, which you can also place the one. The long letter person with neither will share the two person stack. The two players with no debuff will intentionally be hit by the short A, mixed together immediately, and create Ifrit. This will make it impossible for you to mix for the rest of the mechanic, and take dot damage. Healers can treat this like natural alignment again. The fact that you cannot mix is very important, meaning you can safely stack with other players as needed, now that you have a need to. Further, feel free to pick between the three players here. If two of them are tanks, you can intentionally pick those two for mixing. This will make the dot less of an issue. Two towers will spawn mid like normal, but green wind towers are never an option. It will be purple or blue. Resolve as normal and dodge the ashing blaze. Both Ifrits, the leftover alchemy, and the first tower players will all return to the stack corner, just like in High Concept 1. The second set of letter debuffs will go off and not hit anyone else. This will result in there being exactly four alchemy buffs. Four towers will spawn middle in a random order. Two will be green, and two will be whatever color was not in the first set. If the first set was purple, the second set will include blue. Remember, colorblind players, watch the animation closely if your colorblind settings aren't enough. Using the positionings we do, you can send all alchemy players to the middle with no adjustments needed. On the west side, we have the leftover alchemy and the long Y. Long A and B can group up on the east side of the puddles. This will guarantee you have all the elements you need. Like before, position yourselves close together, with one player slightly biased toward the further tower to pick towers with no verbal communication or priorities to remember. You don't even need to worry about the other group, since you can run right through them with no issue. It takes two seconds to mix, and getting into your tower will get you away from everyone. Unfortunately for the other four players, you can't be lazy like with High Concept 1. A clone will spawn at each cardinal of the arena and tether to the closest player. You have a lot of time to get there, but don't dawdle. Pop sprint and head to a clone. Pick static spots for specific buffs to go to, such as Ifrits go west and east, and the first tower players north and south. You can even pre-position within the corner. Whoever is closer to the west edge will get west, while the Ifrit closer to the mid gets east. When you get the tether, Rotate clockwise to the first corner and move out one square. Each clone will do what it always has, an AoE line the size of one square. So a clockwise rotation and one square out will do an AoE pattern like second Gorgons. 
all outside squares get hit, while the middle is safe. As long as you avoid the lasers of the other clones, you will survive. Everyone group up at the boss with some minor positioning. Have one bird and one ifrit stack together west, and another stack east. Do not stack the fish or horse players. Ifrit players will regain their ability to mix about the same time as the clones shoot their AoEs. Mixing Ifrit and Bird creates Immortal Spark. Four Immortal Sparks and the whole arena mix together to create a Fire Bird, the Phoenix. Top everyone's HP off as soon as you can, and then you are able to stop healing. Phoenix will automatically set everyone's HP to 1, provided you had full HP already. You do not need to heal this. Hephaestos is casting Ego Death, which is a hard enrage. But with Phoenix, you will all be revived. Once you revive, you will be given a massive damage up buff. Death at this point is a definite wipe since you lose this buff. But luckily, there are no more busters or even auto attacks. He opens the re-entry with Ionagonia, a much stronger version of Ionupire, but with a slightly shorter dot. He will also gain a damage up stack from this and all future casts he does. Dominion is similar to Limitless Desolation. Spread out as the cast finishes. All players take raid-wide damage, and four players will get targeted AoEs, so spread out. Two support and two DPS. Four towers will go out in a random semicircle in the front half of the arena. They will slowly progress from the center of the arena and toward the edges. After going far enough, they rise out of the ground and explode. There are two sets of four towers. The players who get hit by the initial targeted AoEs are forced to take the second towers due to a damage vuln. Count the towers starting from west and going clockwise to east, one to four. The easiest way to do this is to just split groups up like Limitless Desolation. Support west to take towers one and two, DPS east for towers three and four, and have some basic priority system in place. Melees take priority on Tower 4, with the lower priority melee taking Tower 3 if both ranged players are hit by the initial debuff. Also keep in mind that the tower positions are very random. You could end up with three, or maybe even all four towers on the exact same side of the arena. So being east is just your relative start spot, and some adjustment might be needed. You can also use your Gorgon teams again if you prefer. Team Tower 3 and Team Tower 4. If both players have the same debuff, or lack thereof, have one designated person from each team swap. First Towers is the Eyes of the Gorgon, and Second Towers is Blood of the Gorgon. It's an alternate way of thinking, but leads to the same overall solution as priority. After both sets of towers have been taken, group up mid for Ionigonia now with two stacks of damage up, and Dominion a second time with three stacks up. The first Dominion didn't hit all too hard, but with the stack ups, it will be significant this time. It is otherwise the exact same mechanic with no new rules. Group up mid one final time for Ionagonia. Mitigate this properly and you can entirely drop healing. Push your DPS for a second Ego Death cast. There is no coming back from this one, so push every last bit of DPS you can and you can come out with the clear. Congratulations, you just finished the tier. Thank you for watching this guide on Abyssos, the Ace Circle Savage, Part 2. Like, comment, subscribe if you want to see more guides. It helps me out. Follow my socials link below, and maybe follow my Patreon for more content like this. Take care, and may the power of Anadid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon, with an extra special thanks going out to... Ashtree Dweller, Ayman Al Khatib, Benjamin Han, Benjamin Haynes, Benjamin Rice, Sadia Dios Hassan, Serix, Ethan Olson, Ethan W, Frazier97, James Hall, JB Hruska, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Marlon Sebo, Mizella, Nick Griffin, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. Thanks again, enjoy your shiny new weapons and chess pieces. See you for the next guide.